report. Hello, everyone. This is Joseph Schaefer and Nick Mooney. We are the co-leaders of Spillman Thomas and Battles Technology Practice Law Group, and we are back with you today for a bonus podcast episode to accompany our Dakota newsletter. And today we're going to give you a short update on the earlier Section 230 webinar that accompanied Decoded Issue 5. Now, before I jump in to the topics we're going to cover today, we just offer a short disclaimer, and that is that nothing that we um, say today should be construed as legal advice, um, nor should it be construed as creating an attorney-client relationship between you, the viewer, and Spillman Thomas and Battle, the firm, or me and Nick personally as attorneys. I also want to just note that any opinions offered during this webinar are the opinions of me and Nick personally and not necessarily representative of the opinions of other attorneys within our firm and certainly not of our clients. So with that out of the way, what are we going to cover today? Three new developments. The first are proposed reforms to Section 230 from the Department of Justice. The second is an interesting statement from Justice Thomas to the denial of certiorari in Malwarebytes Inc. v. Enigma Software Group USA, LLC. And the third is the Federal Communication Commission's announcement of rulemaking on Section 230. So what's prompting all of this activity? The first is an outgrowth of ongoing efforts from the Trump administration to address Section 230. Our original webinar talked about an executive order from President Trump instructing the executive branch to look at ways to reform or adopt regulations regarding Section 230, and some of this is coming out of that. The second is proposed legislation in Congress. There have been bills introduced by, among others, Senator Hawley, that would reform Section 230. And the third is this recent activity in the content moderation space, with perhaps the most significant story recently being Twitter's ban on a New York Post story about Hunter Biden and emails that allegedly surfaced on a hard drive found in a New Jersey computer repair shop. So we're going to talk about each update in order, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick Mooney, who's going to start us off with the DOJ's proposed reforms. Thanks, Joseph. So. As Joseph mentioned, uh, President Trump's executive order on preventing online censorship directed agencies to do a number of things. And one of the things it did was direct the, to direct the Attorney General to submit proposed revisions to Section 230. And these are those. We have those now. It was about a month ago. As a matter of fact, it was a month ago today that those were uh, sent by the Department of Justice. And although they address all of the subparts of uh, Section 230, we're just going to hone in on the revisions, the proposed revisions to C1 and C2, the two immunity from liability provisions. But before doing that, let's take a step back and remember what C1 and C2 say. C1 is the, the magic 26 words that make uh, the internet possible. Under Section uh, 230, C1 provides no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information that's provided by another information content provider. So what does that mean? That means if, example, if Elon Musk is on his phone and he tweets on Twitter something defamatory about Jeff Bezos and it's up on Twitter, Jeff Bezos doesn't get to sue Twitter for that defamatory statement. Twitter enjoys the immunity from liability and that's really what C1 provides. C2 is a little more involved and it has two parts to it, but essentially C2 says no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of the first part, any action that they take to voluntarily, any action taken in vol voluntarily in good faith to restrict access or availability of material to moderate content, com content moderation, removing content. If the action is taken in good faith and the provider or user considers the information to be, and there's a laundry list of things, obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. Keep a, keep a little note about the otherwise objectionable and keep a little note about the good faith belief. And they enjoy this immunity from liability regardless of whether the speech, the content is constitutionally protected. That's the first half of C2. C2 also has a second half that says, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be held liable 
for any action taken to enable or make available to information content providers or others the technical means to restrict access to material. Sort of a filtering technology like a net nanny, something that allows certain content not to load. Those are how C1 immunity from liability and C2 immunity from liability currently stand. That's how they currently stand. So what does the DOJ want to do? Well, a couple of things. First, with regard to C1, they make clear that if a, if a um, provider or user of an interactive computer service is engaged in this content moderation, the restricting access, the restricting availability, removing of content, those people can no longer rely on C1 immunity. You don't get to rely on those 26 words in C1. Instead, if you're going to have immunity at all, you have to rely on C2, which has the good faith requirement. So remember, kicking by, by pointing those people to C2, they now have to meet the good faith standard, and we'll talk about that in a second. It requires some additional showings. The other revision to C1 is this creation of a new subsection that essentially says, if you meet the good faith standard for one content moderation decision, that doesn't automatically meet, mean you meet it for all. You're going to have to make this showing every time. Those are the proposed revisions to C1. Let's take a look at what, it, what the proposed revisions want to do to C2. Pretty interesting. Remember that C2 had this catch-all. The user um, can remove access uh, to material, this content moderation, if it met this laundry list of uh, things. If the, if the material was obscene, lewd, lascivious, and then it goes on and says, or if the material is otherwise objectionable. The DOJ wants to get rid of that. And it's interesting, if you look at the cover letter that Attorney General Barr accompanied the proposed revisions with, the cover letter to Speaker Pelosi and the cover letter to uh, Mike Pence, and he characterizes the otherwise objectionable as the blank check. He calls it the blank check that everybody can hide behind. Well, DOJ is getting rid of the blank check. That, at least that's what they propose to do. The other thing that uh, the DOJ wants to do to C2 is to change it, it as very core. Instead of saying if the provider or user believes the information is obscene, lewd, lascivious, et cetera. It's now, it would read if the provider or user has an objectively reasonable belief. So we're making an objectively reasonable standard. It's an objective standard instead of the subjective belief of the person making the decision. The other, the other proposed revision to C2, remember we were talking about the, the net nanny or filtering. Well, now if you're going to provide net nanny or filtering um, technology to others, again, you have to meet the C2 good faith standard if you're going to have immunity from liability. So a lot of revisions, a lot of proposed revisions, you know, what's, what's it all mean? Sum it all up. What's it all mean? What, it, what all these revisions do is seek to reduce the scope of immunity. It's going to make it harder for people to get immunity. They're now going to have to meet a good faith standard if they're engaged in any type of content moderation. The good faith standard in, is in later proposed revisions that require you to have a term, require you to have terms of use or service. They have to be made available to people. They have to be understandable. You have to spell out in them when you're going to engage in content moderation. So you can't just say, I took this content down because I thought it was obscene. Now you're going to have to meet this heightened standard, the good faith standard. The other thing that it's going to do is, you know, uh, coming, Joseph, we're both litigators. I, I think if you in, impose an objectively reasonable belief standard into this, it has the potential to foster litigation. Uh, people who are sued for content moderation decisions, they're no longer going to be able to come in and say, look, I believe the material was lewd and lascivious and seen. So I should get the protection of this immunity. Instead, they're going to have to show that not only I believed it, but I, that an objectively reasonable person is going to believe. And that's going to be a fact question. And I think it's going to be very hard, virtually hard, virtually impossible to get out early in the case. You're going to have to go through a certain amount of litigation before you can avail yourself of that immunity from liability. So a lot of proposed revisions, I think every one of them reduces the scope of the uh, potential immunity from liability. And that's it from the DOJ side. Uh, Joseph, kicking it back to you for a discussion about Justice Thomas's recent statement. Before we talk about Justice Thomas, um, Nick, I think uh, an interesting um, piece about the DOJ's comments are that it would seem to align the 
Section 230 with what its critics currently say that it um, says right now. So it, it sounds like there's an amendment that's required before it's going to match up with what the critics say the Section 230 um, says currently. So I thought that was interesting. The other thing I'd like to point out for our viewers or listeners is that this is just a proposal and it's not law yet. It would have to be adopted by Congress and signed by the president. And of course, we have an election coming up in just a matter of days, which could change things. But interesting proposals nonetheless. So that takes me to Justice Thomas' statement on the denial of certiorari in malware bites. And that was a case that came up to the Supreme Court from the Ninth Circuit. There was an, an opinion in that case that essentially held that an anti competitive claim or a claim of unfair competition was not um, precluded by the um, catch-all provision in section 230C2. So that's a, a filtering um, case, um, which is interesting given that most cases arising under section 230 fall under section 230C1. And it in fact was a case that involved the otherwise objectionable exclusion with the Ninth Circuit saying that this unfair competition claim didn't fall within that um, exclusion, so, or within that provision. So what did Justice Thomas do? Well, he agreed with the court's denial of certiorari in the malware bites case, but he took the opportunity to address some issues that he thought exist with the or thinks exist with the lower court's current interpretation of that statute. And what's interesting, just as a starting point, is that while the case before him arose only under Section 230C2, he also took the opportunity to address some criticisms with Section 230C1, or the lower court's interpretation. And he did so in a way that sometimes conflates the two and makes it difficult to track which um, section he's talking about at any given time. So a few points before we jump into his criticisms, but the first is that this is not precedent. It's simply a statement on the Supreme Court's so-called shadow docket. Um, it does signal though, that there's at least one vote on the Supreme Court for limiting the um, protections against liability under section 230C. So that's point two. And the third is that it's likely to be cited by critics of section 230C, whether precedent or not, as at least persuasive authority for limiting the reach of those liability protections. So why is it going to appeal to critics of Section 230C? Well, the first is that Thomas repeats a lot of the criticisms that have been levied against the statute, primarily from conservative critics. Uh, let's go through those, and there are five of them. The first is that Justice Thomas says the judges have stretched the purpose and policy to convey broader protections than what Congress could have intended. And that's a pretty traditional textualist argument from Justice Thomas, but it also matches what some conservative critics have said, which is that Section 230C was really intended to protect against things like pornography, not against um, commercial speech or, or other types of speech. The second criticism that Justice Thomas levies is that <sighs> He thinks the lower courts have failed to distinguish between a publisher and a distributor. And as a brief reminder, a publisher is something like R Random House that actually publishes the book um, in our traditional print media environment. And a distributor is somebody perhaps like Barnes and Noble that is going to distribute that book from the publisher to the ultimate consumer. Now, in Thomas's view, Section 230C1 only protects publishers, not distributors. That's a narrower liability. And I think it really plays into this concept, both from Thomas and from other critics of Section 230C, that the protections are not supposed to be for entities that are using editorial um, functions. The third criticism that he levies is against decisions that, in his view, have interpreted Section 230C1 to preclude liability when exercising editorial functions, such as whether to publish, withdraw, postpone, or alter content. Think, for example, of those warning labels that Twitter or Facebook have been putting on election-related content, or the removal of content that is deemed by those platforms as misleading. Thomas seems to think that this conduct crosses the line from publishing content provided by another information content provider which is protected under Section 230C1 to the creation of the publisher's own content, which is not protected. So in other words, Thomas seems to think that 
a information content provider has to leave the content up as is or else in that if it modifies that content, it runs the risk of becoming, um, opening itself up to liability. The fourth criticism that Thomas levies is that when section 230, in his view, is read as a whole, it should be understood to preclude liability in only two circumstances. The first being for the non-use of editorial functions under section 230C1, and second for the good faith use of those same editorial functions under section 230C2. So again, Thomas is saying that if you remove content or you alter content under section 230C1, you shouldn't be entitled to the protections that subsection offers. But he does say that um, you could be protected under section 230C2. And keep in mind, as Nick said, that contains a good faith requirement and it's also more limited in the type of content that can be filtered out or, or modified or edited. And the fifth comment and criticism that Thomas levies is that he says the lower courts have been dismissing claims that should probably have been considered product defect claims outside the scope of section 230C. And this isn't necessarily a new criticism, but he does offer an example from a lower court case of a dating application that in his view failed to implement proper safety features such as the prevention of harassment. So is Thomas right? Well, like most things, it depends on who you ask, but in our view, Justice Thomas has gotten a few things wrong. The most notable is that he seems to um, be confused a bit on Section 230C1's protections for editorial functions, insofar um, as he limits that to the non-use of editorial functions. But he's also, in our view, confused about the relationship between C1 and C2, and in many ways seems to conflate the two. Now, we don't have time today to go through all of those criticisms in detail, but if you're interested in, in seeing a, a critical review of Justice Thomas's statement, there are two good sources of information, or, or good, two good posts. One is from law professor Eric Goldman at his Technology and Marketing Law blog, and the other is from Mike Masnick, who is behind the Tech Dirt um, blog. And you can find both of those by Googling Justice Thomas, Section 230, and either Eric Goldman or Tech Dirt. So with that, Nick, I'm going to turn it over to you for a discussion of the FCC's proposed rulemaking. Okay, thanks, Joseph. So uh, jump back with me again to President Trump's executive order back in May. Another one of the directions that it included was a direction to the Secretary of Commerce, in conjunction with others, to petition the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, to propose rules that would interpret Section 230 and to propose the the proper scope of those rules. So last week, uh, Chairman Pai, uh, FCC Chairman Pai, issued a statement, and you know, it's important to understand what the statement is. Honestly, it's also important to understand what the statement is not. We do not have FCC rules yet. The petition was filed. The Secretary of Commerce filed the petition. We do not have rules yet. We don't even have proposed rules that we can review and make comments on. Rather, Chairman Pai has issued a statement uh, that says, I've been asked to do this, I've been petitioned to do this, I've checked with the general counsel and I'm empowered to do this, I have the authority to do this, so I am going to do this. He's basically stating his intention to engage in the rulemaking process. And that's really all this statement is, is I'm going to go forward with proposed rulemaking under, the, under section uh, 230. But in that, and this the statement's only a couple paragraphs long, but in that he makes really, I think, three statements or three references that I think are important that the that the viewers or listeners should hone in on, take heed of. Is in the first one he uh, cites to Justice Thomas's statement that you just went through in the malware bites. So he refers to that explicitly. Uh, the second statement he makes is uh, he, he makes the statement that he believes many people have advanced an overly broad interpretation of the immunity from liability that goes beyond what is provided in the text of Section 230. So again, looking to the text, and I think the rules will probably be anchored to the, to the text of 230, but that remains to be seen. I thought that was an interesting statement. The other interesting statement that the, the viewers and listeners should pay attention to is, is uh, Chairman Pai says, Look, social media companies have a First Amendment right to speech, no question, but they don't have a First Amendment right to a special immunity from liability that other media outlets 
like newspapers and other broadcasters don't get. They don't have a special right to, or First Amendment right to a special immunity. So I thought those statements were really interesting and you gotta sort of factor those in when you think about what proposed rules we will see. But as of right now, as of last week, we have a statement, no rules, no proposed rules, but we have a statement that Chairman Pai and the FCC are gonna go forward with the rulemaking process. That's where the FCC rules stand right now. Nick, that last uh, comment from um, Chairman Pai is really interesting about uh, social media companies not having a First Amendment right to a special immunity denied to other media outlets, because he's right in a very literal sense that the First Amendment would apply equally to social media companies and to print media companies. But one thing that I think it, it's worthwhile for us to point out is that there is a distinction between First Amendment immunity and Section 230 immunity. And yeah. it's an interesting distinction in, in terms of how it plays out. And let me give you an example. If the Washington Post for, publishes an article that is um, defamatory or that um, has a defamatory quote in it, the First Amendment might, might not protect that um, quote or, or that article from a lawsuit alleging defamation when it's in print, but Section 230 might offer protection to the Washington Post for the version that's published on its website. So you could have the same article that would receive different protections depending on whether it's in print or in electronic form. And that's not a function of the First Amendment, that's a function of how Section 230 operates as a statute on top of the First Amendment protections. So just something to keep in mind there. Now what does all of this mean? I think the thing that we can say with the most certainty is that it means that there is a growing momentum in the Trump administration to pare back Section 230. We can also say with relative certainty that there is at least one member of Section of the Supreme Court, and that's Justice Thomas, who would do the same within ju the judiciary. What we don't know, of course, is what the other eight members of the Supreme Court think, I'm assuming, as you can tell, that Justice Barrett will be confirmed here shortly. And the last thing that we really don't know is what this means, given that we have an election coming up so shortly. But I think that we can predict, as dangerous as that might be, that regardless of the outcome, <laughs> Nick's, I see you're laughing, um, and predictions are dangerous, and um, we know that certainly that they're dangerous for elections in, from our experience with 2016. But I do think that we can say whether under a, a Biden administration or under a Trump administration, the push toward Section 230 reforms or amendments is going to continue. What's going to likely um, depend on the outcome is whether that push comes from the executive branch or whether it's coming from Congress. So we hope that you've enjoyed our update. Again, this is Joseph Schaefer, and um, with me today is Nick Mooney. We're co-chairs of Spillman's Technology Law Practice Group. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe, and don't forget to subscribe to our Decoded newsletter. And lastly, keep an eye out for an update on cryptocurrency and blockchain that will be coming with Decoded Issue 10. Look forward to talking to you soon.